We're going to be talking a little bit extemporaneously about Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest. This is a comedy of manners, um, which means that it is a satire, a send-up, a lampooning of social niceties, mores, conventions, etiquette. Whenever I have my students read this play, I require them to use a British accent. In the past, I have made it optional. This year, however, I require it um, because a lot of the humor that is in the play only works with a British accent. And why is that the case? Because a British accent is very affected, very formal, very drawn out, elongated, stiff, prim, and proper. And a lot of the humor in here is overtly making fun of that style of being, that sort of affect. As you can almost immediately tell, the title of the play is a pun. So earnest is both a name and is both a character trait. Being earnest as a character trait means being honest, being forthright and candid, and not having any secrets. Of course, the title of this play is verbally ironic because a lot of characters in this play are dishonest. And they're dishonest in a double-dealing way. They have aliases and AKAs. So, for instance, Algernon lives in the city, goes to the country. When he goes to the country, he his excuse for going to the country is to see a very sick friend of his named Bunbury. Bunbury does not exist, right? But this is his excuse for escaping his humdrum normal life, living out this alter ego, flamboyant, richer life in the country. In much the same way, Jack um, lives in the country, goes to town um, every now and then, but his excuse is that he's seeing his ne'er-do-well younger brother by the name of Ernest. So we have that aspect of the play, this dramatic irony is a, in addition to verbal irony where we know the true identities um, of the players or at least we come to know them but a lot of the characters in the play don't know them until the very end until the final reveal um, what is doubly verbally and not so much dramatically ironic because we don't know this until the very end is that Jack is all of the time named Ernest and he only discovers that at the end of the play. I think it's pretty interesting that Oscar Wilde writing this was writing about how both Jack and Algernon lead double lives. And Oscar Wilde is known as being a gay man, especially during the time that he was writing this play. He would not have been able to embrace that identity in a public sense at all. Um, and so I think either whether he was doing this on a subconscious level or he intended it, and I probably lean towards intention because, you know, obviously Oscar Wilde is a very smart dude and I'm not saying that I'm seeing anything in his work that he himself was not aware of at the time. Um, but I think this is sort of a commentary on the fact that he could not live out his life and be authentically who he was at that time period. Another curious aspect of the play is that it has a lot to say about the institution of marriage and about whether or not the institution of marriage is something to be desired or something to be trivialized. And I think that in a lot of aspects, the characters both trivialize and desire marriage at the same time. Um, and we can again, I think, see this as sort of autobiographically a commentary on Oscar Wilde in the sense that, you know, he would obviously not have been allowed to marry whom he loved. Um, and so in that sense, he's making uh, fun of the institution of uh, marriage but he's also desiring it too, right? Because he knows that it is denied him in a way that it is not denied to others. One of the great things about this play is that it's incredibly quotable. So you can read this play and there are quotes that just shine out of the text like diamonds. They stand on their own outside of the context of the plot or the play. I think probably the most quotable character in the play is Algernon. And he's very aware of that fact that he is quotable. Um, so. For instance, one of his quotes is, um, all women become like their mothers, that is their curse, no man does, that is his. I think the other incredibly quotable character in this play is Lady Bracknell, and she is the mouthpiece of British society of the time period in all its buttoned up, stuffy ridiculousness. Another sneakily, deceptively radical aspect of the play is I think the fact that Gwendolyn and uh, Cecily, both of them, desire a husband with the name of Ernest. And so 
we can view that as being sort of a superficial desire, like, oh, well, that's, that's very inconsequential. That seems unimportant. Why would you want that? I think it's radical in the sense that Gwendolyn and Cecily are able to openly state their criteria for a man. And that sense is pretty forward thinking because the, the women in the play dictate the relationship, right? So they say, well, if this criteria is not met, the relationship does not happen at all, right? It's nixed, nil, right? It just is um, a thing. It just isn't a thing. I think to one of the takeaway morals of the play, you reach the end of the play and Jack says, what is that line? On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I've now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. And this is after he discovers that he is, in fact, actually named Ernest because his dad was named Ernest, uh, Ernest John. Why is that important? Well, I think this whole play is about being authentically who you are and not giving a woohoo um, about what anyone else th uh, thinks about it. It's being authentically yourself in a world that wants to make you otherwise or that wants to dictate who or what or how you should be. And again, this is a very light-hearted, breezy sort of play. It's not anything heavy, and I think Oscar Wilde knew it himself. In a letter to Arthur L. Humphreys, um, Oscar Wilde writes, My dear Humphreys, I enclose you a stall for Thursday, the last to be got. I hope you will enjoy my trivial play. It is written by a butterfly for butterflies. And so that last line I love, it is written by a butterfly for butterflies. A social butterfly, right? We have that as a connotation, but also we have this idea that it's very light, right? A butterfly just alights on you and then flies off, right? And so this play, it leaves an impression that it is a very slight one and it is very, it's kind. This play is also hilarious. The humor is very pronounced and it is very, self-referentially present. It's almost as though Oscar Wilde is like speaking to himself in a mirror and entertaining himself, right? And by making fun of the upper classes of England of the time period, um, he is making us laugh along with him. There is something infinitely amusing about Oscar Wilde amusing himself in the play because you can hear his own amusement at his lines in the play. You can hear him laughing along as we laugh along. A lot of the humor is you don't get a belly laugh, but you get a sort of knowing wry smile and maybe a chortle, maybe just like a very slight um, chuckle. We like the characters, even though we think they are rakes and even though we think that they are immoral on certain levels and even though we don't necessarily approve of their actions or their dishonesty, we still like them because they are hilarious and they're funny and they're lovable. A lot of the characters seem to be very like Oscar Wilde in that sense, right? They are lovable um, despite the fact that they are somewhat abrasive, that they are perhaps maybe even a little bit too clever um, and have a very high opinion of themselves. And yet we love them, right? We love that, that um, ostentatious display of ego. Another underappreciated or maybe I think under-remarked aspect of this play is the relationship, the romance between Chasuble and Prism. Um, this is the cutest relationship in the play by far. And why? Because it is pure. It's pure in a sense that is delightful. I also like how Chasuble and Miss Prism, when they speak to each other adoringly, they speak metaphorically and horticulturally. They, in a sense, disguise their appreciation, their love of each other with these adverbial uh, qualifications, which I think is pretty funny and adorable, by the way. Another wonderful line in the play um, happens at the very end. Jack says this, Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he has been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you forgive me? And Gwendolyn responds, I can, for I feel you are sure to change, <laughs> which is funny, right? Because he's like, oh, I have been honest this whole time. Can you forgive me? And Gwendolyn responds, oh yes, I'm sure it won't last. I'm sure you'll be deceptive and deceitful and lying in the future. 
This has been a very rambling talk about the importance of being earnest. Maybe you have found something of value in it. I certainly find something of value in it every time that I read it um, with my students. I think that my students actually enjoy reading this play too, and not just because they get to use a British accent, although a lot of times their British accents morph into Australian accents as they are reading. Um, and then some students who are experienced with a British accent will maybe do a Cockney accent, which I like a lot. Water bottle, water bottle, water bottle, water bottle, water bottle. That's why I like this play, Oscar Wilde, The Importance of Being Earnest.